getting a handle on the way technology is used by governments, businesses, or even you and me is no easy task. But INSEAD and the World Economic Forum have been doing just that for nine years. This year's nearly 500-page Global Information Technology Report was released at the end of March. Here with us to talk about his role in the report is one of the authors, INSEAD Professor of Information Systems, Sumitra Dutta, who is also the Roland Berger Chaired Professor in Business and Technology. Thank you for being here. Hello. Right, your, your chapter highlights the Networked Readiness Index and using various sub-indices, pillars to calculate a global ranking. What, what did you actually look at for these rankings? Well, Shelley, I think, you know, the bigger context is that the world is becoming much more connected, much more networked. And this is having an impact on the way we live and also in the way business is conducted. So the Network Readiness Index is really some kind of a holistic measure about how ready is an economy to benefit from all this connectedness and all this interactivity that's emerging today in society. So to measure that, we use a variety of indicators, not just technology. It's a set of indicators linked to the environment, the broader political, regulatory, macroeconomic environment in the country. Set of indicators linked to the readiness of people, the human capital, the institutions, educational, schools, colleges to use technology, and also ultimately, of course, the leadership provided the government in driving the entire force of technology in the economy. Is there a specific uh, couple of items that you could mention that would illustrate a little more concretely what some of those topics are, what some of the criteria are? For example, let's take the case of education. You can put computers in schools, and that is one measure of, let's say, degree to which technology is used in schools. Yeah, but who's teaching? Exactly. So the question then arises, the fact you have computers in schools, does it actually mean that the students graduating are better educated or learning fast, learning better? So you need a set of measures which also look at how the technology is going to integrate it into the curriculum, into the learning processes. So fundamentally, you need to be able to combine measures that integrate the actual presence of technology with the use of technology, with the impact of the use of technology. And that's one reason why measuring these things in an economy becomes very complex because technology is everywhere. It's not just in one sector. How important is entertainment in all of this? Because I notice that you keep mentioning entertainment, and I guess that's one way of teaching people, but is that a separate category, or, or how important is it? This is an excellent question because I think there are two elements to it. So one is, of course, the experience of using technology is moving into the domains of entertainment. Today, if you look at, in many advanced economies, a typical young child spends more than seven hours online. And this is incredible. In a, week? In a day, every single day, more than seven hours online. So fundamentally, it's not that they're just surfing the net, they're also communicating, they are doing the work. It's a combination of different things, bringing a different lifestyle. So now when we talk about entertainment, there's clearly an issue in terms of you know, the definition of entertainment in terms of what happens when the person is online. But also the second issue is what is the world of technology? Is it just your hardware company, the software companies traditionally, or is it also a whole bunch of new media companies producing movies and video games and other kinds of entertainment? So I think you're seeing an impact of this word entertainment at two levels. One at the individual level and the experience that they have, and second at the more macro level in the industry structure. You know, as the world changes so quickly, largely because of technology, because it gets pushed into change, I mean, have you changed your criteria? And how do you keep up with the pace of change that technology creates? Well, this poses a constant challenge. So, yes, we do change the criteria, but we do keep the overall framework to be constant. The overall framework, we believe, is very holistic. It looks at the environment, it looks at the three actors, individuals, businesses, and governments and looks at how ready they are and the actual usage of technology by these actors. So I think in the big structure framework is pretty constant. But the individual variables to measure each of these constructs do vary from time to time. Now part of the change is driven by technology changes. A good case in point is today broadband has become much more important. Five years ago broadband wasn't there as a very important indicator. Today broadband indicators are much more important. Five years ago, fixed line telephones penetration was very important. Today, people are asking the question in terms of is it a relevant indicator any longer? So it's quite possible that fixed line telephone will be dropped from the indicator list in the near future, while the mobile broadband, for example, might become more stronger. So yes, there is an evolution of technology metrics over time. 
let's look at some of the countries here. I, they, the top one this year is Sweden. For the last couple of years, it was Denmark, which has been booted down to number three. But the top 10 seem to have at several, almost all of the Scandinavian countries. Why is that? Is it just because the days are short and they have nothing else to do at night? Or why is, why is this the case? Well, that's uh, you know, probably an easy answer. But uh, I think Scandinavian countries in general do very well on most of these kinds of analysis and metrics, not just in technology and a variety of other factors too. And the reasons that they do very well actually are linked to some good policies regarding the macroeconomic environment in general, good policies regarding investment human capital, good business friendly policies in general, and also I think a love of technology which has led to some very strong technology players emerge in these economies. The whole growth of Ericsson, Nokia, and the whole creation of a technology, uh, you know, venture capital and technology entrepreneurs in this whole region has created a sense of technology being a key enabler of the knowledge economy, an economy in which they see themselves as major players going forward. In the, in the top five, we certainly have Sweden, Singapore, Denmark, the U.S. is up there somewhere. Um, what impact have the BRIC countries had? And are they, I guess they're increasingly important. Yeah, you see an interesting pattern in which the BRIC countries are moving up rapidly. And I would say this especially for India and China. Uh, you see this year also India and China have moved up, jumped up quite significantly in the ranking. And this is not a phenomena of just this year. It's been happening over the last several years. Uh, Brazil is improving. But I must say that Russia is stagnating. Russia, in fact, is not doing that well. No, I was surprised. It's way down on the list. I had to look exactly. at around number 100. So, you know, Russia, what you see is, of course, as I, t as I mentioned earlier, we measure not just only technology, but also a variety of issues linked to the environment, linked to the human capital investments, and linked to the broader environment in which business and government can use technology. Mm -hmm. And Russia often does not fare very well in those environmental factors. So what you see is that uh, even though they've got good people, uh, they don't have the right climate to encourage investments in knowledge-based sectors, knowledge-based companies. So Russia as a whole is not necessarily doing as well as it could. Now, in terms of setting a, a kind of a, the, the outline going forward, the, the China-Google debate over censorship and that sort of thing, is that likely to have an impact on rankings or will it set a platform on which future growth will be determined? China is a very special case because China is a huge domestic market and China is going to be a very important player in the future. So I think there are broader implications to this whole uh, China Google story in the, in the, is, is, is to the degree which, to which China wishes to influence the way technology is used. Because fundamentally in this case what is happening is China is trying to influence the technology used within its boundaries. And tomorrow, if China sets, for example, standards in some technology areas that can again change the way technologies are developed, is used in key areas of, for example, uh, you know, uh, security or in mobile telephony and so on. So I think the world is watching this debate very carefully, not just because of the privacy issue, but because it can potentially influence the way technology is developed and the way technology is used. Now you mentioned creative industry exports, going back to our earlier touching on entertainment. As you said earlier, the question you asked earlier was, are the boundaries blurring? Mm -hmm. And the boundaries between entertainment and technology are certainly blurring. And if you look at, for example, the latest blockbuster movies like Avatar and so on, these movies, you know, to what degree is it technology driven? To what degree is it, you know, actor driven? That's a very good question. So what you're seeing is uh, the creative sector is becoming much more important. And creativity, of course, is expressed in different ways. And the media entertainment sector is one of them, which is highly creative and let's say, you know, creativity driven. But the role of technology in enabling creativity, in supporting the development of creative products, and of course, if you have creative products, you can of course hopefully export them. And that, so when we measure creative exports, that really is a proxy for the degree of creativity that is happening inside an economy. And we assume out there that that's another proxy for how technology is helping develop this entire sector. What impact do you think that the economic crisis will have on all of this kind of development, but, but also on entertainment? What, what, how do you see this maybe looking ahead to next year? First of all, there are 
cycles in the economy that happen over time. So economies go up and economies come down and they, you know, they have cycles. Uh, so I don't think that the economic slowdown or recession that we have had in the last 24 months is going to have any long-term negative impact on technology. If anything, people are realizing that they need to invest more in technology to become more cost competitive and to become more efficient. So the investments in technology and operations, the investment in technology in variety of, you know, let's say government services is going to go up and has gone up. And that's what the results and uh, data show. Uh, what is true is that uh, the investments in some of the newer areas of development, let's say, for example, green technology and these other areas, those are influenced by the willingness of people to invest in new ventures and in new kinds of uh, risky opportunities. So in times of uh, recession, sometimes that might decrease on a temporary basis, but the market forces do pick up very easily and the market demands and the market forces will drive investments in those areas. And sometimes when the market fails, the government steps in and the government provides incentives. And this is what is happening in many economies, including China, the US, and Germany, and many economies, where the government is providing the stimulus, the right support for helping drive investments in some of these new areas, even though the traditional, let's say, mode of investments might be perhaps a little bit slower than what is expected. How does the World Economic Forum use the report, and, and how will we use it at INSEAD? Well, the World Economic Forum and INSEAD are much more platform organizations in a sense that they build platforms in which they get multiple stakeholders together. So both of us are very similar in our desire to try to create these kinds of environments in which we can get multiple stakeholders together. So the actual question which is interesting is what do the stakeholders do with this report? So both the INSEAD and the forum, we get together leaders from the public sector, the private sector, and get into discussion and dialogue about the results and conclusions of this report. And what we find is for governments, for many governments, this is absolutely vital. Uh, you know, what we have been very pleased to observe is that uh, many governments in the world have based the national technology deployment policies on the results and on the framework of this research. The entire national policies are based on that. Uh, many governments look at this as an assessment, independent assessment by external party of the efforts in using technology in their own economies. And what about next year? Have you started already? Or are you going to be changing criteria? Well, this is a process that happens in a sort of almost on a 12 month cycle. So we just released the results uh, today. And fundamentally, with the next two or three months, we'll be spending a lot of time on the dissemination. And what we intend to do is, of course, begin the next cycle of data collection in the near future. And uh, the entire process of collecting data, doing the analysis, producing the report takes a good eight months. It's a lot of work. Thank you very much, Sumitra Duda, for being with us on NCAD Knowledge. Thank you very much.